Hey everyone, welcome to Hub Chat. I hope you've all had a great week and managing to stay safe and well. Tonight, we have a very special edition of Hub Chat where I'll be interviewing Pastor Conrad Vines all the way from the USA. Welcome to Hub Chat, Conrad. Uh, good evening and welcome to all of your listeners. It's a pleasure to be with you here tonight. Fantastic. And it's great to have you here to, to catch up and talk about some of the things that are happening in this world and in, in the USA and also in little old New Zealand. So, Conrad, before we get into the discussion, could you please just tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, your background and where you're ministering at the moment? Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, I was raised in the United Kingdom in a pastoral family. My father was a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. And uh, we spent uh, our uh, formative years in big industrial cities like Leeds and Birmingham, Bradford and Hull. After high school, I went to Israel for a, a gap year uh, during 1990, during Gulf War I. And uh, after that, a business degree. Uh, then a couple of years as a health service manager in Britain before uh, the Adventist Development and Relief Agency, ADRA, invited me to come and serve with them in Azerbaijan, uh, which is just north of Iran and south of Chechnya. Uh, so I was out there, then to Tajikistan and northern Afghanistan. And uh, for the next 10 years, I floated around the world with ADRA, uh, doing a lot of um, disaster response work. Uh, it's the kind of thing where you're sleeping at home and you get a phone call and you have to be in Colombo in 24 hours because there's been a natural disaster. Uh, after that, uh, after praying about it with my wife, we went back to Newbold College in England. That's an Adventist college. Uh, it's a seminary, prepared for the pastoral ministry, and was pastoring in London and Minnesota. Uh, did a stint as a church administrator, um, covering 17 countries in the Middle East. And now I'm living in Michigan, southwest Michigan, uh, just east of Chicago. Uh, it's a beautiful countryside here. And uh, I've been serving as the president of Adventist Frontier Missions uh, for 10 years now. And uh, our mission is to establish uh, Seventh-day Adventist church planting movements among unreached people groups. And maybe your listeners will be surprised to know that in our world today, maybe 40% of the people on planet Earth as of today have yet to hear the name of Jesus. Wow. And Jesus said that uh, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed as a testimony to all nations and then the end shall come, Matthew 24, 14. And uh, so we've got a long, long way to go. And as an Adventist, uh, my hope and my joy, the blessed hope, is that Jesus is coming again. And then this world full of sorrow and sin and pain and disease and death and suffering will be no more. And every tear will be wiped away. So I'm filled with hope because Jesus is coming again. And it's my privilege to serve as the president of a mission organization. We work in about 22, 23 countries across um, North and West Africa and the Middle East, Southeast Asia. It's known to missiologists as the 1040 mission window because uh, it's 10 to 40 degrees north of the equator in terms of latitude. And those are the heartlands of Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, Taoism, Confucianism and communism in China. Yeah. And so my job takes me all around the world. And uh, even during this pandemic, um, you know, we've all been affected by the pandemic differently. You know, the governments may have a like a one size fits all policy for everybody. Uh, but in reality, we've all been affected by the pandemic in different ways. Yeah. And um, you know, true. I know you in New Zealand have had very strict rules, as in Australia. Um, I've managed to float around different countries. Uh, I've been down to Brazil and elsewhere during the pandemic. Uh, every weekend I speak in a different part of the States. And so um, I travel pretty freely all the way through the pandemic. Uh, those are the rules we have in the United States. Wow. And uh, so it, um, I would say that for my family, the pandemic was a blessing because we, were, we could spend some time, quality time together in lockdown at home before my son went to college. But I know that many families are grieving the loss of a loved one. Uh, there's an empty there's an empty chair at the table at uh, family festivals and, uh, and um, holidays. And so many people are grieving. And so this COVID pandemic has it hasn't affected everybody in the same way. And some people True. have been hurt by it and some people kind of glided through it. And uh, so, yeah, that's what I do. And I get to see the Holy Spirit at work every day with answers yeah. to prayer and miracles. And so I love what I do. I'm sure you're very busy, very busy man. And it was quite interesting, Conrad, because last week we had um, Pastor Greg Timmons, who was a part of Adventist Frontier Missionary in Cambodia. So he was talking about his mission stories here with us yeah and uh, you know greg and molly timmons and their family did an incredible job out there they were working among the penong and animist group in eastern thailand and 
Um, you know, we um, some some missionaries are there to plant the seed. Other other missionaries are there to water the new plants, and others are there to reap the harvest. And uh, Pastor Timmons and his family did it really. God worked through him in a powerful way. And uh, when they arrived out there, it was their second stint in Cambodia. Um, they, we were just starting to see the first shoots of people turning to Jesus Christ in faith. And uh, by God's grace, under the Timmins' leadership, a number of churches were planted. Our local Bible workers were trained. And that work is continuing to go forward, even though the Timmins' have returned to partial ministry in New Zealand. So God really blessed through the Timmins' ministry. And, um, you know, we, we forget sometimes in the West, um, particularly secular people like in America or New Zealand, um, we tend to downplay the reality of evil. Um, but if you're an animist community and uh, you live in fear of the spirits and you make sacrifices every day to appease the spirits so they won't hurt you. And those spirits are very real. And so let me give an example of the dilemmas that missionaries face if a family become a Christian within an animist village or city, um, the rest of the village looks at that Christian family and they say, because of you, the spirits are angry. And if my if my child dies or gets sick, it's your fault because you became a Christian. And if my child dies, I may kill your child in revenge. We see this in Southeast Asia. We see it in parts of Africa. So when people are deciding to follow Jesus Christ and turn away from the spirits, and those spirits are very real, um, they, they, they're terrifying. They, they can overwhelm you. Um, when they turn away from the spirits to Jesus Christ, who has all authority in heaven and earth, and in whose name the spirits are driven away, um, they know that there's going to be a time of testing because the community is going to be very upset. You know, if a, if a, um, a bullock dies, if a car crashes, um, if a house mm. burns, if a child goes to hospital, it's always the new Christian's fault because the spirits are angry. And so um, they were working among animist communities, dealing with these very, very difficult situations. Uh, but I, I um, you know, I've been raised in the West and people may think I'm crazy to talk like this, but I deal with deliverance ministry on a weekly basis. People call me here in America. Um, they may be secular people. They played with an Ouija board at college. Um, they maybe had some tarot cards done. They had their horoscope drawn up for them. And uh, they can't get away from the sense that there's a shadow in their life holding them back. And for some people, it may manifest itself as maybe something trying to strangle them at night, uh, manifestations at night that they can't explain in their bedroom, but they're terrified of this. And so we find here in, in America, people who are secular, just like you have there in New Zealand, who are calling in for deliverance because they recognize there's something evil around that in their home or in their life, and they can't get rid of it. And so it's my privilege as a minister of the gospel to be able to minister to people in the name of Jesus Christ and to set them free. Amen. Amen. Well, Conrad, I've got some questions for you. But before we start into these questions, let me just open with a word of prayer and invite the Holy Spirit to be with us this morning in our discussion. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we'd just like to thank you. Thank you that Conrad is here with us to discuss some of his stories, to some of his experiences. Lord, please send the Holy Spirit to this into this conversation and also we pr pray god that someone at home may see a clearer picture of you through this discussion we pray this in your precious name jesus amen amen okay conrad so this is a this is a, one of my own to start with um i've noticed lately you've been talking about the unthinkable <clears throat> in fact some of your sermon titles i think were like unthink and unthinkable and you mentioned in these sermons <coughs> it's time to think of the unthinkable. What do you mean by that? What What are you trying to say to us? Okay, so um, uh, what I was talking about in those sermons was that as you look around the world today, we see that freedom of conscience is steadily being eroded in country after country after country. And uh, governments are putting greater and greater restrictions on freedom of conscience for people to believe, to change their religion, to leave their religion or to adopt a new religion. And uh, particularly during the COVID crisis, when people are sitting at home, they may be sitting in despair or in fear. Many people are turning to prayer. Many people are turning to their spiritual um, sources for, for comfort. And uh, what we see around the world today is that there is more and more pressure on people to, to lose their religious freedoms and freedom of conscience. And of course, freedom of conscience uh, involves the freedom to be able to think and to be, to be able to speak and to have an open dialogue within your society. And what we see in the West um, with the rise of what scholars call critical theory, 
um, is the idea that there are oppressors and oppressed in our world and uh, the oppressors have dual insight. They see the world from their perspective. So the oppressed see the world from their perspective and from the perspective of the oppressors. And therefore, they they have the voices that should be heard in society. And so increasingly, we see on social media like Facebook um, in particular and on YouTube, there is ever greater control on what you can say. And if you don't speak the, the dominant narrative of today, the groupthink that's affecting your society, then you're going to be deplatformed. We have cancel culture. And uh, if you if you are cancelled, um, uh, then you are destroyed professionally and personally and financially and socially. And so you may be a woke social justice warrior. Uh, the problem is, is that today's dogma very quickly becomes tomorrow's hate speech. And uh, and so even woke justice, social justice warriors um, of various kinds are being cancelled because they're not keeping up with the latest twists and turns in critical theory or critical race theory or critical gender theory. And so we're seeing across the West the stifling of free speech, when with that comes the stifling of free thinking. And that's going to um, inevitably impoverish our societies. And so I was talking as a pastor about the fact that um, uh, intolerance is rising, particularly to those who don't bow the knee to the con the, today's dominant narrative. And if you're a Christian and you hold to uh, certain biblical perspectives on, say, morality and marriage and human sexuality, it just gives some good examples, uh, then you're going to be um, uh, cancelled and deplatformed and shunned from polite society. Well, this is what we call soft totalitarianism. Hard totalitarianism is where you see um, concentration camps and people like you know, the KGB knocking on your door as it was in the Soviet Union. Um, we haven't reached that point yet in the West, um, but we're moving in that direction um, because the, the, the powers that be across the West uh, seek to impose their dominant narrative across all media and any, any dissenters are going to be crushed these days. So I was asking the question, um, how do we as Christians respond to this? And we don't respond by wringing our hands and whinging about it because uh, the gospel is truly good news for all people. And I'm not ashamed of the gospel, it is the power of God to save everybody within our world today. And so um, let's say 50 years ago in New Zealand or in Australia or in America, um, nobody in society viewed the churches as being sources of oppression. They were viewed as being an integral part of the fabric of daily society and daily life. Nowadays, with critical theory and becoming the dominant ideology across the West, um, churches are viewed as being sources of oppression, as being the cause of suicidal ideation among LGBT uh, youth and teenagers. And as uh, through biblical morality, we're actually holding back people's ability to find self-expression and self-actualization and to fulfill uh, their, their true sense of who they are, particularly because the churches are opposed to critical gender theory. So this means that the churches in the West are increasingly viewed as being archaic and also dangerous because we are holding back the, the ability of individuals to achieve their happiness. And so it's only a matter of time before the soft totalitarianism that we're now facing in the West is going to turn into a hard totalitarianism. And uh, that will involve the imprisonment of pastors, the closing of churches, the closing down of the gospel witness within society. And in the unthinkable sermon that I gave a few weeks ago at our local church, in Bering Springs, Michigan, um, I was talking about some principles that guide the underground church, uh, principles that enable the church to flourish, even though the church may not legally exist, uh, to essentially become an underground church. And history has taught us that whenever the church is underground, it flourishes uh, because uh, it means much more to the members. And uh, we live in a society now in the West where many people are, have no purpose in life, they have no aim in life. Um, they're kind of living meaningless existence. They they just uh, they just live in the the froth of modern day. Um, they live in the froth of modern day entertainment culture, and uh, such an existence is really kind of uh, has no grounding, and it adds, actually adds no meaning to life and no purpose. And so, when the church goes underground, um, I was talking about some basic principles to guide an underground church movement. So the church doesn't legally exist, so it can't legally be closed down. It doesn't have bank accounts, so its bank accounts can't be frozen. It has no paid pastors. Therefore, those, those pastors uh, can't be in breach of employment law. And so if you, have, if you have a church with no legal existence whatsoever, it's almost impossible to close it down because you may imprison the pastors like they used to do in China in the Cultural Revolution, but the members are leading the house churches themselves. And what we see in places like Iran 
where you have the repressive regime of the Ayatollahs, uh, we see in Iran that they, they have the fastest growing underground house church movement in the world. In Iran, under the noses of the Ayatollahs, mostly led by women who've been miraculously healed and who've had dreams and visions of Jesus. Uh, we see wow. this is how the underground church grew in China in the 60s, 70s and 80s during the time of Mao Zedong and the Cultural Revolution uh, when China was killing uh, millions of its own citizens. Mao Zedong yeah. killed maybe 60 to 80 million of his own citizens. And so wh when that same ideology that was driving Mao, which is Marxism, that same ideology is the foundation for critical theory and critical race theory and critical gender theory. That same ideology is now the dominant ideology in Western governments and Western corporations. And so sooner or later, that ideology will be expressed in a totalitarian repression of professing Christians. And wow. so I was talking about the need for Christians to think seriously that uh, one day you may not be able to go to your local church. You may not be able to have a wedding in your local church. You may not be able to say goodbye to your loved ones with a funeral in your local church. But everything is going to be done in an underground manner. And we can see what's happening in the world today. And uh, so sooner or later, it's going to happen in the West, this kind of repression. So we need to be getting ahead of the curve, um, ahead of the, in the game and becoming ready and, and uh, preparing for when those days arrive. Yeah. I mean, you also mentioned in there about um, this was similar to what it was like in Jesus' day, that the churches were meeting together and mm -hmm. they were <clears throat> much more. There was, uh, you know, no pastor, so to speak. They were giving all, prayer, praying with each other. I mean, mm -hmm. so are we, is that where we're really what we're going to go back to, a, sim, a similar biblical model? Yeah, we may find ourselves, before we even realize it, going back to an apostolic model of, of home churches, uh, people meeting um, in their houses for worship and for praise, for fellowship and study, and for witness in their local community, for helping the poor in their community, uh, for ministering to the, to, the, to the discouraged and the socially isolated um, we may find ourselves back in that model of doing church and before we before we um, would otherwise plan for it. But I think it is going to happen eventually. Um, we know that the way history goes uh, and if we understand what's driving the woke ideology of you know uh, what's happening in Australia, what's happening in New Zealand, what's happening in Britain, happening in Australia in America as well, this woke ideology um, accepts no no alternative worldviews. And today it may cancel you via cancel culture, but tomorrow it will be locking you up in a camp somewhere. And so that's what happened in the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. It's what happened in over a dozen countries of the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union. It's what's happened in communist China. It's what happened in communist nations in Southeast Asia. Mm. And uh, this is the inevitable um, development of Marxist ideology as it's imposed upon, upon the West. And for your listeners, what this means is that um, COVID... Uh, you know, we, everybody wants to get back to normal. You know, when are we going to get back to normal? Well, I don't think we are going to get back to what we were like before because we've changed. We've changed as societies. We've changed as individuals. We've changed as employers and employees. And we've changed spiritually. And we've changed in what we will accept within society in terms of infringements upon our rights for the so-called common good. And so we're not going to go back to how we were uh, what we've seen is that all across the West, and um, I don't know much about what's happening in New Zealand, but I know I see it in Australia, I see it in Britain, I see it in America, is that when um, people in, in authority, let's say a governor or a prime minister or a local mayor even, when they suddenly discover that they have almost unlimited powers when they declare an emergency, they're very, very happy to declare emergencies and assume the role of a petty dictator wherever they, you know, over their community. And um, in, in those states of emergency, you find that your civil rights seem to vanish overnight and, uh, and due process is suspended. And that's what we've been living with in the West now for over 18 months. Mm -hmm. And uh, we see the thirst and appetite for absolute power among our politicians. Um, and that's not a good sign for the future of Western society. No, very similar to what's happening in New Zealand, Conrad. In fact, what's interesting to me is even some non Christian talk back hosts in New Zealand have lost their jobs. You know, some have been retired early, like immediately. And mm -hmm. what that astounds me that there, there are people that even aren't religious that are standing mm -hmm. up and saying, hey, something is wrong here. We have lost mm -hmm. all our freedoms. 
You know, we we we're seeing something different in society, and I, it's got to help me wonder whether these people are going to be led to Jesus too. You know, through these things, whether that's going to impact them, and and they're going to see Jesus through these circumstances. Well, that's a very good point you make. Um, and people these days are very afraid. You know, that our mainstream media is pumping out a diet of of horror every day of the COVID pandemic. And when people are afraid, they they'll do almost anything. And uh, it's interesting that uh, um, during the Nuremberg War Crimes Tribunal in uh, Germany, 1945, um, Hermann Göring, who was the commander of the Luftwaffe and the second in command to Adolf Hitler, he was asked in the War, Trim War Crimes Tribunal, um, how did the Nazis get the Germans to do what they did in the Holocaust in World War II? And his answer, he says, well, it wasn't what the Nazis did. He said basically. Um, if you can make a population afraid, then they'll do anything to keep to hold on to what they have today. Yeah. And so what we see in the West now is, is a diet of fear and terror on our um, news feeds, our social media feeds, daily updates on how many people have died and all the rest of it. And people are afraid. And uh, fear is not a rational thing. It's an emotion. And you can't reason with someone who is afraid because reason involves the frontal lobe of your brain and fear is more in the limbic region of your brain at the back of your brain. And so um, the antidote to fear is love and a perfect love casteth out fear. And for people to understand that, you know, I, that I'm your neighbor and I love you and I'll demonstrate my love for you and practical care for you, that can help people overcome the fear that is crippling them today. Um, uh, yet our governors, our governments know that when people are afraid, then they will do strange things. And what we see in America is we're seeing the demonization of the unvaccinated uh, by the vaccinated. And let's say there's 80 million Americans have, de have decided they don't want to be vaccinated. Uh, they're sometimes called the vaccine hesitant, or I would call them the vaccine educated. But the, the vaccinated uh, parts in the media are trying to demonize the unvaccinated and to turn one part of society against another. And uh, this is what happened in Nazi Germany, where over seven or eight years before the Holocaust began, the German people were being conditioned to hate their neighbors if they happened to be Jewish. And so we're, we're seeing um, a breakdown in the cohesion of Western society. Um, even beyond that, yeah, you know, the most intimate relationship in my life, other than with my wife, is with my doctor. I go for my annual medical. I call it the ritual of humiliation. And I go for my <laughs> annual medical, <clears throat> you know, and they poke and they prod and they stick and they jab and all the rest of it. And they know literally everything about me. And they see the changes in time. They see the, the bumps and the lumps and they see the scars and all the rest of it. Well, um, historically, in New Zealand and Australia and across all the, the, the countries of the West, um, when you went to see your physician, you understood that your physician was your advocate, that your physician was going to do the best for you, and that your physician was your champion in whatever battle there was with any health bureaucracy or hospital that didn't want to do a certain procedure. Your physician yeah, you would fight trusted for you. Them. You trust them, yeah. don't you? You think, okay, I don't understand this, but I trust you. <laughs> Um, but in totalitarian systems, um, physicians become agents of the state. And uh, we saw this all through the Soviet Union. If you were a dissident in the Soviet Union and the government wanted to get rid of you, um, they could simply put you in a, in a mental health institution and the doctors on the orders of the state would inject you with psychotropic medicine and they would alter the way you think and they would make you go crazy. So then the government could say, look, this dissident really is crazy. Um, we saw it happen in Nazi Germany, where it was medical staff who were killing off children in the late 30s who had disabilities um, in order to purify the German race as the Nazis saw it. And so when we have the rise of totalitarian regimes, we see that nurses and doctors and medical personnel in our hospitals, they actually become agents of the state towards us rather than being our trusted um, trusted people that we, we want to talk through our most intimate details in life with. And that this pandemic is breaking down that relationship of trust between patients and their physicians, um, because we're not quite sure what is that, why is our physician recommending certain procedures to us anymore? Um, am I going to be uh, face any um, negative consequences if, for instance, I don't get the vaccine and so forth? And so um, it's breaking down the trust relationship that is essential for human flourishing with the healthcare system in any country. 
there, there are many consequences of this COVID pandemic. And it's not just those who are dying. We're also seeing a breakdown in cohesion in our societies in the West for a whole variety of factors, some of which we've just covered. And uh, that's a long term wound that we're going to have to recover from in our societies. Mm. So, Conrad, how do we how do we as Christians deal with this pressure? Then, <laughs> Like, obviously, there's some things the government wants us to, to do and some things. I mean, Jesus talks about, you know, live by the the rules of the land but how do we deal with these pressures as christians i mean you obviously have come under a fair bit of pressure for some of your messages no doubt how are you mm -hmm. dealing with it what's some practical steps uh, oh yeah that, that's a really good question um <laughs> so you know if, if if your listeners go to a website like audioverse.org audioverse.org and type in my name you'll see sermons there on, on transgenderism and same-sex marriage and abortion and critical race theory and critical theory. And these are kind of topics of great interest today. And, and whenever I preach a sermon like that, what I find is for about two weeks, there's a vicious pushback on social media. So after I've preached, I don't look at social media for a couple of weeks. That's just to preserve my sanity. Um, but after that, for months, in some cases, years, I receive a stream of letters and emails and phone calls from people in every continent other than Antarctica saying thank you for the courage to stand up and speak. Uh, we're praying for you and for your family, and uh, may God bless you in your ongoing ministry. And what I've realized is that um, there are those who are loudest in society, and then there is the majority um, who are often quite cowed, and they may be afraid to speak up for themselves, but they're grateful when somebody stands up and says something that what many people actually believe is to be true. And so, um, yeah, I have found pushback from some of my preaching, uh, but on the other hand, I've been able to minister to, for instance, I preached a sermon on, on abortion. And uh, the question is, um, if, a, if a woman aborts her child, uh, will she ever see that child again? Now, I know as a pastor um, that when you meet with a woman who may be in her 50s, she is often carrying a scar from the abortion. The abortion doesn't do well for women in, in emotional, psychological health. And so um, many women who've aborted children in their 20s live with um, regret and guilt and inability to bond with their other children and with um, self-hatred and a sense of um, unworthiness. And there's a profoundly negative consequence of abortion on women. And so I preached a sermon asking the question, what does the scripture say about aborted children? And if, if a woman gives her life to God and asks forgiveness, does she have the hope that she can see her child again? What does the word of God say about this? Now, of course, um, I got a lot of pushback from feminists um, who were really angry that I was talking about this. Um, but the net result of that was I had a stream of women coming to me over the following weeks in tears saying, thank you for preaching on that topic. And now I have hope that I will see my child again and that God will forgive me and that I can see my child again. So as a pastor, knowing that members of the congregation are actually struggling with that guilt and that fear and that self-hatred, and that self-loathing and inability to bond with their uh, their other children, um, it was my responsibility to preach a sermon that dealt with what my parishioners were going through. So, oh, wow. um, yeah, I do face pushback from my sermons, um, but I think that you know uh, the, the the word of God says that he who speaks truth in the gates of the city, that is in the marketplace, is often hated. Um, it's we easier. We see this for in the Bible, don't we? We see this all yeah. through the Bible, all the prophets. They were hated yeah. by their own, by their own yes. too, which is yeah. this real shame. And, and it's easier for us as society to to believe convenient lies than to face truth. And a truth is a two edged sword, and it calls us all to live um, more in a more responsible way and more conscious of the impact of what we say and do on our neighbour. Mm -hmm. And you know, as a Christian, you know, Jesus taught us in the, the, the Matthew seven verse twelve to do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And uh, you, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind is the greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And so for there to be healing in any conversation or relationship between two people, there must be truth. You know, if I visit a, a counselor, let's say I have depression, and I just tell a pack of lies, um, the counselor is probably going to say, look, Conrad, um, if you want there to be healing in this process, then there must be truth in the conversation. And if 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 there is no truth in the conversation, no matter how painful that truth may be, then 
but then my mental health state will not get will not improve, for instance. Or if you have a husband and wife who are having troubles together, I know as a pastor that when, when you bring them together for marriage counseling, there has to be a time to say somewhat painful truths if, if there is to be any um, long-term redemption of that marriage. And so with the challenges we face in society today, um, we are still called, you know, if we have a platform, let's say you have a, a beautiful program here and I sometimes preach in the pulpit, um, we have a responsibility to speak truth. And in a, the Bible says that Jesus came full of grace and truth. And so truth on its own without grace is like a clashing symbol. And grace on its own without truth is kind of like, um, like um, it's kind of meaningless. And so we are called as pastors to proclaim truth, but season it with grace, because that is how Jesus lived his life. And when there is truth in a conversation, uh, you, you have the possibility of healing of that relationship. So um, it, do, it does take courage. You know, I do get a lot of um, pushback from people, emails, stuff on social media. Um, but if you're called into pastoral ministry, you have a responsibility before God to preach truth. And, uh, and to allow the Holy Spirit to work on people's hearts. Praise the Lord, Conrad. Well, we appreciate the truth being preached in the age that we live. Uh, how, do you, how do you think our thought process needs to change in this new environment that we live in order to reach people? Obviously, you know, being president of Adventist <coughs> Frontier Mission, I guess this whole COVID thing, has it, has it changed some of those ministry aspects or is everything still still the same well, that's a really, really good question and i would say that um since covid came along uh since covid came along there has been a massive increase in spiritual issues in many parts of the world um, because covid has shaken people's confidence in their governments it's destroyed their confidence or belief in what their uh, public health physicians are saying uh, here in america which is a divided nation uh, a huge proportion of our nation believes that Dr. Anthony Fauci is a serial liar. And anything he says, you assume the opposite is the truth. We don't, we no longer believe what the CDC says. We no longer believe what the president says. We no longer believe what Congress says. We no longer believe what the mainstream media says. And so one of the casualties of COVID is not just people's lives, but it's the social cohesion and the trust that we've had with our institutions in society. And uh, in this era, in this era of kind of social meltdown, um, the old certainties are gone, and uh, people are asking uh, maybe for the first time in many years existential questions such as who am I, and where have I come from, and where am I going, and if I if my child dies of COVID, will I ever see my child again? And when I'm in lockdown in my apartment, you know, you may be in a city and you've been in lockdown for months, which has happened in some parts of the world. Um, how do I find peace in the midst of the storm? And so it's uh, what we find in AFM is that people are very interested in spiritual matters. How do you find peace of heart in the middle of the storms of life? And uh, so we, we've seen a big increase. There's internet searches are, are increasing in different parts of the world for, you know, will somebody pray with me? Um, people are asking questions such as what happens after I die in their Google searches? Um, how do I know what's gonna happen after I die? And so um, COVID has actually shaken people out of, let's say, um, what for many people was a time of complacency, just living the good life without thinking about the important questions of life. And it's forcing us to ask hard questions such as, what does it mean to be a human being? How do I know what is a life well lived? What does it mean to be a good person? Um, do I have hope of living after death or is this there, all there is to life? And so COVID represents a huge opportunity for people of faith to share the good news that there is a coming savior and his name is Jesus. And he died for all peoples, regardless of the color of their skin or how wealthy they are or how educated they are. And he is preparing a home in heaven above for those who have faith in him. And in that home in heaven above, uh, the book of Revelation says in chapter 21 that every tear will be wiped away and death and disease and sorrow will be no more. Revelation 21 verses three and four. It's a beautiful description of what God is preparing for those who are faithful to him. And I'd like to encourage your listeners, you know, if, if you're listening to this, um, if you can find a Bible, uh, just to start reading, let's say, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, those three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And you'll read the teachings of Jesus of what it means to live in relationship to your fellow man 
in a way that is redemptive and restorative and builds justice in society and brings peace to your heart. I mean, you um, you also, I've heard you say once before that we need to actually start to memorize these things. And even me and my wife are thinking, wow, you know, we've gone, we, we, we shifted quickly into the digital age, our mm-hmm. Bibles and everything. But now we often look at each other, we need to fill, fill our bookshelf back up and then fill our mind back yes, up yeah. with, with the Bible. Yeah, I think, you know, with the Google generation, um, we're used to a world in which um, uh, you say, well, you know, who was the 14th prime minister of New Zealand? And rather than knowing it, I have to ask Google. <laughs> and um, so uh, th- this means that when you're disconnected from your electronic devices, you, you're pretty much you're an empty mind. And uh, the, the point about this is that before you can have understanding, you must first have knowledge. And Google may give you the knowledge in little, little like bite-sized chunks, but unless that knowledge is embedded in your head, like your history, the history of your nation, how your nation came about, the highs and the lows, the good bits and the bad bits, unless you have that knowledge in your head, it's very hard to make sense of what's happening around you and to understand what is happening and to make wise decisions for what is going before you. And so in the Soviet Union, uh, one of the things the Soviets targeted was history teachers because it, once you can eliminate a, a people, let's say the people of New Zealand, if you can eliminate your your memory of, of what is New Zealand and how New Zealand came about and the history of New Zealand and all the good, the bad and the ugly in New Zealand history, every nation has good, bad and ugly parts. Once you've eliminated the past, the, the, the totalitarian power will control the future. Um, but if people understand their past and their history and they understand the flow of history and how society has, de- has developed and evolved over time, uh, that, that, that society is much harder to control. And so with our shift to uh, asking Google for everything, just asking for knowledge, we're losing the ability to understand the times in which we live and the ability to make wise decisions going forward. And so as Christians, it's imperative upon us to carry the word of God in our hearts because there are many parts of the world, such as the Muslim world, where people cannot carry the word of God openly. They cannot carry a Bible or they may be executed in, say, Afghanistan or parts of Iraq or in Iran. And so it's important for the Christians living under persecution to memorize key passages of the scriptures uh, so that uh, they can still carry the word of God as a light unto their feet and a lamp unto their path. Uh, even when they no longer have the Bible physically in their hands. Mm. Uh, Conrad, I have to ask you this question because I, I mentioned before about there's a lot of people in, in this world who aren't religious that are starting to prick up their ears or, or saying, hey, something's not right here. But mm-hmm. as as a Christian, <clears throat> as an Adventist who's so-called mm-hmm. been brought up with the truth, you know, mm-hmm. how how has this pandemic, How has what have you seen we you like, wow, you know, we've been taught we've been taught about this for years. We can see these things coming. Have you noticed that? I, I've noticed that as a Christian, as an Adventist too. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, as Adventists, uh, we, we are keen students of prophecy. And we believe that prophecy in Daniel and Revelation is an unfolding of events from the time of Daniel, the time of the Apostle John through to the second coming of Jesus. And uh, we have long understood as Adventists that For instance, America would start in Revelation 13. There are two beasts, and the second beast, it starts as a lamb, but it eventually ends up speaking as a dragon. And we see that in the United States of America today. Adventists have long taught that America is that second beast that starts as a lamb uh, with two horns. uh, That's um, republicanism and Protestantism and the separation of church and state. And America starts as a lamb, as a force of good in the world, but it ends up speaking as a dragon. And then it imposes its will as a superpower on the entire world. And we see that through the book of Revelation, chapter 13. And eventually the United States imposes a death penalty on those who will not worship according to the dictates of the United States. And uh, in this COVID pandemic here in the United States, we've seen America change in front of our eyes. We've seen presidential mandates. We've seen governors issuing lockdown orders and extremely stringent regulations. We've seen the, the right to worship be suspended in many states, the right to associate um, to be suspended. People have been cancelled off social media for disagreeing with the narrative. And we've seen a very strong totalitarian trend take over here in the United States. And as we see these things happening as Adventists, 
Um, do I like it? No, because I, I love the United States and I think the founding principles are some of the finest ever enunciated in human history. But I know prophetically where this is going. And uh, it's things are going to get rough before Jesus comes again. And so um, I see the prophecy unfolding in front of my eyes, the change in America. And uh, I, personally, I grieve the loss of freedoms that goes with these changes. On the other hand, I'm excited because it means that Jesus is coming again. And Jesus talked about this in Luke 22 and 23. You know, he said there that uh, men's hearts will be failing them for fear. And fear is the dominant emotion of our world today. And he says, when you see these things, um, when you see these things taking place, um, lift up your heads and rejoice for your, redemp your redemption draweth nigh. So I'm not living in fear. I travel uh, all the time. I travel from uh, California to New York and down to Texas and up to almost to Canada. Um, I'm not worried about the COVID. Um, I've traveled overseas and I have a job to do before Jesus comes again. By God's grace, he's kept me healthy all this time. I've never tested positive. And uh, I'm looking forward to the coming of Jesus and uh, working so that as many people as possible can have the blessed hope in their hearts uh, that Jesus is coming again. And that when he comes, every tear will be wiped away. And that's a beautiful thing to carry you through the day. So my, my neighbors are very secular. They're living in fear. I'm a Christian and my heart is filled with hope because Jesus is coming again. Amen. Live live in hope, not fear. Isn't that amazing? So, yeah. so Conrad, how do we ensure, though? How do we ensure that we're ready for Jesus' second coming? I know it's a simple question, but it's probably the most important. You can understand the timelines. You can understand the prophecies. But how do we ensure that we're ready for Jesus' second coming? Okay, so that's a really good question. And um, <clears throat> I, I would say this, that uh, this is kind of a little like a theological issue here. Um, if you confess with your tongue that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. Um, that is the promise of Romans chapter 10. Uh, Jesus says in Mark 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So the thief on the cross, um, Jesus promised him that he'll be in paradise with him. And that thief was still hanging on the cross, but he accepted Jesus as his savior by, by faith. Now, you know, uh, if, if you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior today in your life, uh, then you may live another 10, 20, 30, 50, 80 years or so before you die or before Jesus comes again, whenever he comes. And that's when what um, theologians call the process of sanctification takes place. That's when God strips away your fallen self and replaces it with the fruit of the spirit, love and joy and peace and kindness and gentleness and self-control, for instance, and long suffering. Um, but how can I be ready for the coming of Jesus? Well, I accept Jesus into my heart as my savior, as I recognize I'm a sinner, that uh, I've sinned, I've made mistakes in my life. There's would have and could and should have and regret in my life. And uh, that um, I am a lost individual, that I have no hope beyond the grave outside of myself. And I ask Jesus to be my Lord and savior. That means I accept his death on Calvary for my behalf and has my Lord, I'm now going to uh, live my life according to his teachings and I'm going to become his disciple and I'm going to look at his teachings every day in the morning and ask God to give me the wisdom and the strength to live out those teachings day by day. And so Jesus says, you know, for God so loved the world, a very famous verse, John 3:16, that uh, that he gave his only begotten son, that is Jesus, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that phrase believeth in him. In the West, we often, we change the word. We actually say, well, Jesus said that whoever has faith in him, like an intellectual faith in this. No, Jesus says whoever believes in him and to believe is a verb. And so I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And then I live out my faith day by day. I am, I seek to be a blessing in my community. I seek to visit the sick, to help the homeless, to feed the hungry, to communicate and bring hope to those in, in prison to be a blessing in my on my street, to be a blessing in my district. Yeah. And in so doing, I show that God has actually transformed my heart. And so maybe the best way to be ready for the coming of Jesus is to ask him into your life, is to be Lord and Savior, to confess your sins, and ask for the Holy Spirit to guide you in a new way of living. And then today, starting today, to ask God to show you how you can be a blessing to those in need in, in your community, maybe your neighbor, maybe your child, maybe your local street, um, the more you are a blessing to your community, the more evidence that there is that God is working in a mysterious way in your heart and transforming you 
and preparing you for heaven above. Amen. Well, thank you so much, uh, Conrad, for spending the time on Hub Chat tonight. And and we are blessed by your sermons and keep preaching the word of God, brother, because we appreciate it here in little old New Zealand as well. And um, I'd just like to say to any of our viewers who'd like to, to connect with Conrad, you can send your questions to hubchatquestions at gmail.com. And also, if you want to, if you're interested in Adventist Frontier Missions, please get in contact with us. So that um, I'm sure there's a lot of mission, you, you, you'd mentioned there's a lot of mission work still to be done for God's mm -hmm. kingdom. So thank yes, thanks once again, Conrad. Well, thank you very much for having you. May God bless you in your ministry and may God bless all of your listeners. Thank you. Amen. Would you like to close out with a word of prayer for us, please? Yes. Our dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege of connecting with Hubchat and through Hubchat to a wider audience in New Zealand. And Father, I pray for the listeners to this program, those who are watching or listening at home or on the road when their morning exercise routine. I pray, Father, that the peace that passeth human understanding will fill their hearts and their minds. I pray, Father, that where there is despair, you will bring hope. Where there is anger, you will bring peace. Where there is a fear, you will bring love. I pray, Father, for all the listeners that as they journey through this COVID experience, that somehow in a mysterious way, you will bring good out of this present evil. Thank you, Father, for hearing this prayer. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Have a happy Sabbath. Mm -hmm.